I was born in Moscow and since my childhood um, the music was not like around me because my family is not professionally musical because my mom she by education she's an engineer the jet engineer so she was working on some details for jet engines and uh, my father he is the mach uh, the cars mechanicals um, worker he, the only thing I remember from my childhood that is really connected with music that my father had uh, his guitar yeah because he was playing in the uh, rock band and I remember him practicing and playing you know um, th at home and uh, my mom she also had a very nice voice and she still has and my mom also plays the guitar the acoustic guitar but again she wasn't a professional musician she was just an amateur who just grabbed the guitar and learned some chords but she really wanted me and my sister to be a musician so she started bringing us both to different um, uh, musical lessons you know for piano lessons solfege a voice lesson and that's how my journey in this musical world start world started uh, when I was six I have been admitted to the Moscow uh, Choir College and I started um, my uh, education there. Uh, the Moscow Choir College is really interesting um, because it consists together the regular school and the music school. So you have the first two hours in the morning you have a choir lessons and then you have a regular lessons mixed with the solfege or piano lessons. This choir college was only for the boys so only boys were allowed to study there and uh, when uh, you get to the third grade from the beginning choir to the children choir you move on to the main choir which is um, the choir that travels a lot uh, which participates in the concerts a lot so I started discovering lots of wonderful musicians I started discovering lots of amazing countries in this world I became a soloist of that choir because I had pretty nice voice when I was a kid and uh, some of my um, singing still can be found on uh, iTunes or Amazon you know because there is uh, for instance, there's a wonderful CD that we have recorded with the Children Choir of the, of the Moscow Choir College. And um, that's the CD of uh, Christmas music, where I was singing uh, Silent Night, Toyland, you know, Little Drummer Boy, etc., etc. And with this journey, with these discoveries, I more and more started to get convinced that this is what I really like. Uh, I mean, I had talent and skills to this, but that's not enough to create the wonderful music. You really have to like it. You really have to love what are you doing and devote yourself for this. So that's when I really started realizing that I want to become a musician. I didn't know what I will be doing, what kind of music would I be doing, whether I will be singing, conducting, playing piano. Also I started learning a clarinet at that time, so I really like that as well. Well that my mother, she was incredibly uh, encouraging and supportive for um, this path that she led me on and right now I think she's not sorry for a moment that uh, she chose this path for me and I'm not sorry as well I'm really happy that she led me there of course at, at the eighth grade um, when boys voices started to transition to men eighth grade there was no choir lesson there was there were only extensive lesson on the music theory choir conducting and uh, piano and 
usually at the ninth grade when the voice is already somewhat mature you know you start singing in the men's choir when <laughs> my voice was breaking really interesting because it started breaking maybe the second half of the sixth grade and ended only at, at the beginning of my ninth grade lesson so from the first discount I started going slowly for the first half year I was becoming second discount then first alto then second alto <laughs> then tenor then second tenor and then I ended up being basso profundo no one can believe that I was but I could sing very low and then my voice started growing up back like decided that hmm, no I don't think that's a nice place to be so I became back to the baritone back to the second tenor back to the first tenor so when I graduated from the Academy from the um, choir college and I uh, got into the Academy I was already um, graduating and starting my new education level um, as a tenor the figure that I really was appreciate as a musician and as a very powerful human is our choir, our choir conductor and the leader of the Academy of Choral Arts and the Moscow Choir College, College uh, Viktor Popov because under his conducting, under his leadership basically that's who I am right now music wise some, some ways person-wise as well because he really trained us in a very strict discipline how to like music how to understand some kind of music that you don't you might not understand at first how to analyze it and get something that you would really appreciate from that you know of course there's some sort of music that might be not your cup of tea but you really need to analyze it and find something that is yours uh, and of course the staff of other teachers uh, our wonderful solfege teacher our wonderful piano teachers who encouraged me incredibly because at some point I really was considering myself that I would like to be a pianist and I started asking for some challenging music and my, my uh, piano teachers were encouraging me and um, it also somewhat disciplined when you have to train yourself for four hours you know sitting at the piano it really gives you some advantages in the future when you build career especially when you have to memorize opera of course I'm very thankful to my first voice teacher when my voice just turned into a man's voice Vera Alexandrova she usually works with uh, students who you know just starting their way um, unfortunately I was not able to walk with her f through my entire um, operatic career way just because you know she led me to some point when I needed I needed someone else to show me some other skills that was our decision and I'm really glad that she she understood this situation and she let me go and I'm very happy that the Academy of Choral Arts is actually a part of this Moscow Choir College so basically when I moved on to another level of my education lots of old people who were knowing me from when I was a little kid they were still working with me and uh, I was really happy to get into conducting choir conducting class to uh, Viktor Popov who was our choir conductor and that boosted all the knowledge he gave me when we were traveling uh, with the choir and performing together the rehearsals uh, he also taught me some it's more like technical ways to conduct the choir to control people to try tell them as clear as possible what do you want from them to perform you know but that was my main background and my start of my musical way to where I'm now okay I graduated from uh, from the choir college because that was the first in 2000 and I was 17 
and the same year I got into the academy uh, another advantage that I got I got um, uh, magna cum laude so it gave me the right to enter to the academy uh, without uh, the in entering exams uh, and I also graduated the academy in 2005 when I was 22 I have two diplomas. One is a choir conducting. It's a cum cum laude, summa cum laude, and uh, the voice, my major. I actually started my professional career when I was in the academy. Really, I should consider my professional career maybe much earlier. And to say, as I mentioned before, with this travels when I still was in the children's choir and when I was a soloist, you know, because that's a big responsibility to step out of the choir and sing the solo and, you know, of course, sometimes you're not feeling good, especially when you're traveling from the city to the city, you know. You know, when we're a kid, it's uh, the fear of stage is a little stronger than when you're an adult. I mean, I did understand the honor of this situation, but the fear was also really strong, especially when you're not feeling good, you're really afraid not to do a wrong note or doesn't so to do something that doesn't sound nice. But when I was growing, developing, I more and more started getting into wanting to be a musician, a performer. And I really wanted to be either just myself or in a small group of you know musicians and when my voice turned into my from the boy's voice to the man's voice and when I started my first voice lessons and when I started understanding that there is a promise in my voice because I not only was you know has been told that my voice is really good but I also realized myself that yes there is a promise and I really need to work hard to make it happen. In 2002, when I was in um, already in the academy, um, I got a call from Viktor Popov, our conductor. Uh, it was me and my classmate, Leonid. Uh, so he called us and he asked how our voices are doing. So we said, yeah, they're doing okay. So Viktor said, there is a problem with uh, at the Helicon Opera, it's the company, opera company in Moscow. They were trying to do um, to stage <laughs> Lulu by Alban Berg. And he warned us that the music might be really difficult. Are you sure you want to go and try to sight read this music? So, you know, we were like 19 years old, so we said, of course, there's no problem for us to read anything, you know, because in the academy we had very intensive solfege and music theory classes, so really all of us were able to read basically anything. So we got to the theater and, you know, of course, without any doubts, we sight read this music and immediately got our first contracts. So. Uh, we got our first contracts and I have sang five performance of Alva. It's uh, Alva. It's a role um, in Lulu. Uh, the role was really big and the most challenging part was we had to memorize this role in two languages, in Russian and in German. Because for Russian premiere we had to sing in Russian because in German you know, um, it might be in, because the music is really complicated and because the plot is also complicated and challenging, you know, it would be difficult for audience to understand what we're singing in German. So we decided to, um, the, the theater decided that uh, it will be more convenient to present for Russian audience this opera in Russian. But a couple months later, we had to go to Spain uh, to the festival in Peralada, the opera festival. There were two actually, one in uh, Santander and one in Peralada. And also in uh, October 2002, we went to Beijing International Opera Festival as well, where we also presented the Luin for those performances. Of course, we had to learn it in German. So that was my first operatic experience, but Lulu is, um, those one of those 
ladies who really likes to play with men and because she's really beautiful she causes lots of craziness over her from the men they're losing their heads and some of them committing suicides and some of them are being killed you know because um, they were fought f they were fought with for Lulu and then Lulu flirts with the son of her husband and then uh, which is Alva which is who I was playing and when um, she kills um, her husband she gets into the prison and there is a lesbian uh, Countess Geschwitz who also in love with Lulu and she's trying to get her out of prison and uh, get into prison herself instead of Lulu and then Lulu gets married with uh, the son of her killed husband. This role, the role I played um, was really really challenging not only by length but by uh, psychological understanding of who I am, you know, because you really need to get into the role, you need to feel it, you need to live through it. And when you're 19, there are some aspects of life that either you understand dif differently than, you know, because now I'm 33, you know, uh, than right now um, or you, some things you don't understand at all because you just didn't experience it so you know some things were understood you know just with the tips of my fingers not mentally fully understood you know um, but I'm very grateful for this experience I'm really thankful uh, I'm very happy it happened it also confirmed my desire to be an opera singer uh, it taught me a lot of the opera theater discipline and the opera world discipline as well. Oh, that's a tenor voice. Uh, yes, that role was when I still was a tenor. And uh, I was trying to develop my career as a tenor. Unfortunately, it was not as successful as my career as a countertenor. I used this base of knowledge to build up my career as a countertenor, and that base that I used was definitely helpful. Yeah, many people ask, well, tenor is really high voice, you know, basically you cannot sing higher. What is the difference between tenor and countertenor? I have to tell everyone that there's even more higher male soprano <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not the highest one but um, yeah tenor is uh, that kind of voice when you approach the top notes on your full chest voice with more head resonation when you sing as a counter tenor you basically sing in the falsetto and one of the very good very um, mandatory requirements of there are actually two to my opinion, there are two requirements for counter tenor. One is to have a really good low falsetto, and another is to have very, very well, well developed coloraturas. Because lots of Baroque operas, they have um, the areas where you have to do coloraturas through the entire, basically entire diapason, working diapason without you know breaking this yodel stuff you know when you switch to the chest voice to do it all smooth even and to do it in a very good speed when you use falsetto your vocal cords doesn't close fully as you speak when you talk on the chest voice on, on, on a voice on the you know regular men's voice you start you start just using um, the edge of the vocal cords I mean they're still working they're still closing the um, the hole but it just works differently. So, being a counter tenor, besides these two things that I mentioned, to having good low falsetto and good coloraturas, you actually, in general, you need to have a good falsetto because there's, there are some people who does not have well developed falsetto just because the way their throat built, the way larynx built, or the size of their vocal cords, you know. Uh, just because of that, they physiologically cannot be a counter tenor, you know. So really you need to see, does it work for you first? 
then you need to see will you be able to hold on for a couple hours you know you know to hold the whole recital or whole performance whole opera role in that range and if that works for you then you need to see okay can i do you know can i sound smooth in any part of the diapason you know do i have good coloratures or if i don't will i be able to speed my voice up to stretch it you know so it's not just the one day decision and that's how it worked for me i felt well let's say that i was really impressed by the country tenors even though i did not i did not considered myself as a country tenor but I really liked and I really it was really attractive to me you know to work with the country tenors to sing along with them there were a couple reasons why did I switch to the country tenor the first and it's again going back to the people who really got uh, big influence on me there was a country tenor in Russia Eric Kurmangaliev he was really famous in Russia because he was one of the first Soviet Union country tenors, you know, and being Soviet country tenor in the Soviet Union, it's a little unusual. He was really strong enough not to get onto these labels and tags and just don't pay attention to them and do do his job. He, I had a wonderful opportunity to work with this wonderful musician uh, twice in 2003 and 2005 and both times we have done uh, Rossini's Petite Messe Solanella. He was singing alto part and I was singing tenor part but both times I was really impressed of his the way he feels the music and the way he the way he lives with this music and he has an amazing voice. It's really unfortunate that in 2007 he passed away. His death kind of shook something in me because I really liked, I mean, we, we were not close friends, but it always was, I was really happy to see him and he was really wonderful. He was really kind, incredibly kind person. He was always so open, you know, so happy to see me, so frankly, you know something just shook in me and I thought that maybe a little piece of his creativity got inside of me and that piece of creativity one was one of those moments when I decided that maybe I should follow this path another another symbolical thing with um, Eric Gurman Galiv right after I transitioned for a counter tenor singing uh, one of our friends uh, we both knew her very well and I still work with her sometimes she decided to create a concert in his memory and I participated there even though my country tenor skills were not nearly as good as now but I decided to sing couple arias in memory of him and at that point I, I clearly realized that I guess that was also the reason why I'm a counter tenor right now. When I started coming to Pittsburgh, I one day I was sitting in the church, picked up the songbook of Handel songs, and I just decided, you know, I should sing it just for myself, you know, to see what is this. Um, I wasn't nearly as as uh, uh, savvy with the Baroque music as I am now because you know I'm working in that uh, repertoire mostly at this moment so th at that time Handel's songbook was something like oh what is this and I decided to sing in a tenor range and it was a little too low and I thought hmm why shouldn't I just try to sing for fun as a lady and I started singing that and my friend got into the church room and he said did you just sing this I thought that I, I did, I've done maybe something terrible and I said, yes. So he said, can you sing P. Jesu from Dürerfle's Requiem? And he plays the organ. So he got the scores for me, got the scores for himself. He put them on the organ and we started singing P. Jesu. I knew this piece from before because Dürerfle's Requiem is one of my most favorite piece of music. I really love that. 
so I've seen that uh, that movement and <laughs> he was shocked by how did it sound so he ran to the staff office and he asked the secretary the reverend of the church the assist the associate reverend the sexton to come to the uh, to the sanctuary and to hear me doing P as a second time so I've sang that second time and all of them said Andre this is what you should do for your life this is your path you should go it I decided that I need to give it a shot when I transitioned, that was a New Year's Eve 2007-2008. Baroque and Renaissance is mostly the main part of the repertoire, just because of uh, the traditions, because of the time it was written, because of the fashion to the certain singers, I mean Castrati at that time and countertenors as well. Um, mostly it was Castrati at that time, you know. Some people disagree with me, but I still will say that there are some roles written later than the Baroque and then uh, Renaissance where composers use um, ladies to uh, to play either young men or even some mature men as well and we all know that you know people calling them as pants rolls but in in the in the situation that we have right now because the counter tenor singing is getting more and more into fashion of the opera world i think uh, the counter tenor who fits a certain way into the certain role has the right to perform that role for instance there is the role of uh, the Knight in um, uh, Russian opera Ruslan and Ludmila Ratmir. That is one of my most favorite roles. I've never had a chance to play the whole role, but I had uh, a wonderful opportunity to sing a um, couple of his arias at the recitals or competitions. Particularly one is my very lucky one <laughs> because this aria helped me to win some very important competitions like the Metropolitan National Council in 2012 or uh, get the third prize at the Operalia competition in 2014. Um, and um, I also was really happy to cover Prince Orlovsky twice with the Metropolitan Opera and um, the second time when I was covering Susan Graham I had a chance to actually step on stage instead of her and perform that role. I think that if you fit a certain way, like it's not only the voice, it's also you know, the way you look. Like I would not be able to play boy like in Ivan Susanin to play Vanya because you know obviously I'm not a boy. <laughs> Counter tenor is pretty fragile voice so of course you need to take a better care. Every voice is in some ways fragile but there are some voices that you really don't need that extra care that you would take about your counter tenor voice because um, of the range you are in. Let's say basses they shouldn't be afraid of you know having an extra drink or smoking an extra cigarette although not all of them doing that but I know some basses doing that especially for to remain this lower um, register in their voices you know I mean of course for counter tenors that's not an option because your top will be completely gone so that's one of the let's let's say the encouragement to you know take extra care of your voice to be more attentive to what material are you offered you know learn the music really well just look through the scores you should know definitely whether you will be able to handle this repertoire or not uh, of course there are some um, invitations that I get that I will I hate to refuse from them just because you know the music is wonderful the venue is really attractive and money wise it's you know a good help to the budget as well but I cannot do it just because I don't want to destroy my voice you know and another thing is also more of your genes 
more of you know how your voice built uh, because when you age vocal cords also ages and even besides taking a really good care of your voice it's also you know the vocal fo folds they're getting weaker they start wobble more and it's inevitable unfortunately for instance uh, James Bauman he was having a wonderful voice even when he was in his 60s and some of the country tenors right now you know might not sound good when they're in their 40s I would say the age that affects it's not because they you know they're taking bad care of their vocal cord so let's hope mine will be <laughs> as much I mean I'll be doing it as much as I can but another thing I should mention that it's really good to exit the stage not when you will be uh, praised by critics that gosh this is time to just knock him off the stage you know but you really should have this sense when your voice is not listening to your to your brain that much anymore you know there definitely will be the sign what I learned from my experience that there is definitely something that changes in your muscular feelings the way you sound you know something disappeared but something else appeared and you really recognize this so you really should be cautious to these signs you cannot just avoid them and think oh you know I'm doing this just because you know my I don't know my, my tonsils are enlarged or you know because I had some extra drink yesterday or because you know the weather is rainy no it's definitely a sign of your organism doing something to you and at some point the signs might tell you that this is it so and it's better to leave before you really start sounding not that nice and when your fabulous career will be crossed with that you know misfortune it's always nice to perform as frequent as possible and I don't mind any schedules I'm ready to sing every day without you know a break but I'm not the only one there are other wonderful singers who also wants to sing who also loves this job who also needs some income to their budget as well who wants to show what they can do and that's understandable so I cannot sing every single gig I really I should not complain myself because I do I did have lots of wonderful events well particularly per, sorry particularly in this season um, again as I said before I had a wonderful contract with the Metropolitan Opera where I covered Prince Orlovsky and in December I had a chance to step instead of Susan Graham, Graham who unfortunately got sick that day and you know I sang the role um, I had a very nice performance recently in beginning of March with the Pittsburgh Symphony here um, under conducting a wonderful amazing musician and uh, the person I really like Manfred Honeck uh, we did uh, St. John Passion and uh, another thing that was really interesting about this performance uh, it was directed by Sam Helfrich so it was a um, half stage performance and uh, it brought more um, interesting um, aspects to this performance you know interesting approach to my point of view uh, the approach that was unique and that was not uh, on the edge of you know getting off the loop of what is this about um, and that's what is the talent of Sam Helfrich because he clearly can keep the idea within going a little out of it I have lined up 
a participation in uh, the Summerfest, Opera Theatre of Pittsburgh Summerfest, uh, this summer again, where I'll be doing the title role in Julius Caesar. I have a continuing relationship with the Opera Theatre. Uh, it started with my victory at the Mildred Miller International Voice Competition in 2011, uh, where I, I won the first prize. And the part of this prize was the participation in the Opera Theatre of Pittsburgh Summerfest. Uh, I should mention that uh, Opera Theatre of Pittsburgh has been founded by Mildred Miller, so that's why from this competition you have a very strong connection with uh, the Opera Theatre. And in 2012 I started um, my collaboration with Opera Theatre and fell in love with each other and uh, since then um, every summer uh, we're trying to get together and do some more wonderful stuff regardless is it opera or is it just you know a recital but I've done uh, two wonderful recitals that I think were very good good of success and I'm very happy that this year we will um, present Julius Caesar the opera and one of my favorite operas and one of my favorite roles even though this role also is a big of a challenge you know eight arias and lots of musical material but this is um, the role that suits me a lot not only voice wise but the way I look uh, and um, I'm very looking forward uh, to do it I am very happy to announce to the whole world that right now I'm working with Claudia Pinza, my current teacher. She's been my voice teacher for six years right now. And I'm still so happy that everything I can do, it's all uh, as a countertenor. It's all her job. Uh, I'm so happy to work with her. I'm very... I'm considering her as my countertenor mama because, you know, she really uh, grew me up as a countertenor, you know, from, from the beginning and I wish her um, as many years to live as possible because I want to work with her, I really don't want to switch to anyone else. I really like her, I'm very happy that uh, Miss Pinza is carrying not only in her last name, but in her um, appearance, in her teacher skills, uh, the name of her very famous father, Ezio Pinza, and I'm very proud to be a part of it right now. Uh, maybe I should see, look at the camera at this point and say, Miss Pinza, I love you very much and I'm wishing you all the best. And I see you on Monday at 11 as always. <laughs> Well, I think I just would like to thank particularly you and all other people who are really supportive of the art and of us musicians, not only singers, you know, composers, conductors and other people of the art uh, for the attention that you pay to us.